Years ago, we used to take the, the streetcar to East Boston and then get on the ferry yeah. for two cents. That's right. And ride the ferry across Atlantic Avenue. I tell you, there's many a times walk. that I walked from Revere to the Boston Garden because I had just the 40 cents to spend to get into the game. That's all I had well, was Well, hot dogs were what, a dime, Roger, 15 yeah, cents? hot dogs were a dime. Hot dogs were a dime, 15 <clears throat> cents. Well, I don't know about beer because I never bought beer. It was the Bruins, the team named after this bear cub found on a Boston street corner in the 20s that consistently had the fans filling all the 14,000 seats. Bruins started that garden there, so they thought they were, you know, that was their territory. We used to gather there at 2 o'clock every day. I remember I was still going to school, and uh, the game actually started 8.30 in the evenings. The Herald called the Bruins' opening night a mob scene, a reenactment of the assault on the Bastille. But the future Bruins Hall of Famer, Milt Schmidt, who in 1928 was smacking a puck around a pond in Kitchener, Ontario, the NHL was where he was headed. Schmidt's first season with the Bruins, however, was delayed when manager Art Ross offered him a contract for $2,000, a deal he politely refused. But the following year, 1936, Schmidt was ready to bargain. Mr. Ross offered me a contract for $3,500. And uh, I wanted $500 more, and I didn't have any agent or uh, <clears throat> lawyer to, uh, to help me. And I was only 18 then, and uh, I says, I'm not signing it. Well, he says, well, wait a minute. He says, I'll go see Mr. Charles F. Adams uh, to see whether he'll give $500 more. So he left the office for about five minutes and came back. He says, oh, Mr. Adams can't uh, see his way clear of giving you $500 more. And I says, well, that's it then, so I won't sign it. I says, I'm going home and play junior hockey. And he says, well, wait a minute, Melt. He says, maybe we can make some kind of a deal here. So I don't know what he did or anything like that. And I says, okay, I'll sign it. On my way out, I thought, well, I'm going to go in and ask Mr. Adams myself why he wouldn't give this little skinny kid from Kitchener, Ontario, who was weighed about 145 pounds at that time, why he wouldn't give me $500 more, which I did do, and I introduced myself to the secretary. And I said, that told her that I just had signed a contract uh, with the Boston Bruins through Mr. Ross, and uh, I'd like to meet Mr. Adams, the owner of the club. She says, I'm very sorry Mr. Adams isn't in yet. That was my initiation to <laughs> the National Hockey League. After the first goal, the Bruins click again. Slick passing by Milt Schmidt and Ray Garipi opens the way. Rookie Doug Moan scores, and the Bruins down the Leafs 2-1. to one. I would almost think that if I was represented by an agent or a lawyer uh, during those years that I played, I would have been handed the uh, uh, ticket to, to leave town the very next day, sent home, and get out of here. We don't want any part of you. And that's just the way it was. So it wasn't really all that bad. It make, made you work harder, and uh, it was a privilege and an honor in those days to play in the National Hockey League. Rather than working back home for 19 cents an hour in a shoe factory, or 25 cents an hour in an ice plant, or 35 cents an hour in a, in a uh, uh, twine factory, and now all of a sudden you're getting $3,500 a year, nobody else had any money. I had it all. For 16 seasons and 32 years overall with the team, that attitude gained Milt Schmidt the respect of teammates, opponents, and fans. It didn't matter that he had to work for the telephone company in the off-season to make ends meet, or that hot and cold towels, along with a tube of Ben Gay, was the extent of his equipment. Milt Schmidt became the most valued, hard-hitting center of the Bruins' famed Kraut Line, as it was called. 38, 39, we win the Stanley Cup. 40, or 39, 40, uh, we finish 1, 2, 3 in the scoring race, Bob, Woody, and I, the first time ever. 40, 41, we win the Stanley Cup again. 
we played for the same salary every year. We didn't get a five cent increase in salary. Uh oh, there goes another fight. Milt Schmidt of Boston and Maurice Richard of Montreal. And this time, as they try to break it up, one of the referees hits the ice. This is a rough game from the opening faceoff with violent body checking along with the fights. As a result, the penalty box is jammed. Well, let me say that it wasn't a picnic out in the ice when I played. We didn't have the charging or the hooking or the holding or the interference. They didn't need to. Instead, the Bruins had the Edmonton Express, Eddie Shore. He was a rough guy. He had like they used to count the stitches. Up to that time, he had about 128 stitches, Eddie, Eddie Shaw. He checked that barely bum. He fractured his skull and he almost died. It was a matter of uh, living or dying for a long time and he finally survived. But he had a habit of holding the skate up to the light before the game and he says, Mr. Green, he says, these skates were not sharpened. Oh yes, they were, Eddie. He says, I said they were not sharpened. Randall, who was the clubhouse boy, he says, take these skates and go down to the Boston Arena and get them sharpened. Now in those days, can you imagine the Boston Gardens did not have a skate sharpening machine in there and they had to jump into a cab and dr drive all the way to the Boston Arena to have the skate sharpened, which he did not do. Ran, or rather, Doc Green told him to sit down the North Station for about 15, 20, half an hour and he says then come back, which he did do. And when he came back, he didn't go to the arena at all and Eddie Shore held his skate up to the light again and uh, here you are, Eddie. And uh, I can remember and hearing Eddie Shore saying, ah, oh, that's better. No helmets, woolen sweaters, unprotected razor sharp blades, as if that wasn't enough to contend with during Milt Schmidt's seasons with the Bruins. But there were other things too, and they were as much a part of the garden as the obstructed views. Well, we suffered considerably uh, in those days due to the fact that if you had a basketball game one night, the ice surface would be taken completely out. And if you had a rodeo with all the dirt that they would bring in, or a circus, and there was many times uh, that uh, due to the, uh, the ice surface not being maybe an inch thick or an inch and a half, why maybe it was a quarter of an inch in spots, and the trains in those days used to come right underneath while well, you'd feel the vibration uh, right underneath you. By 1942, the Bruins had won two Stanley Cups, and Milt and the Kraut line were headed for war. The fans really gave us a rough time due to the fact that there, that there were uh, men over there in Europe fighting and losing their lives, and here we were playing hockey. By 1946, a new floor covered the ice in the garden. With post-World War II lumber shortages, an East Boston company fit together small chips of wood, and they called it parquet. With 247 panels, countless brass screws, and 988 bolts, the Bull Gang laid down a piece of garden history. With an average 3,700 fans watching that first season and sellout crowds in seasons to come, the Celtics made the parquet floor their secret weapon. Because there were certain spots where you could dribble and then the ball just wouldn't come back to you. You know, you'd have to lower your hand to get the dribble to get the bounce back, you know, but visiting teams wouldn't know that, you know, and they'd get steered to a certain spot and the ball would go dead. You know? <laughs> You'd either get a traveling call or somebody steal the ball, it'd bounce off your foot and go out of bounds. Boston, mayhem is committed in the name of sport. But it was boxing, not basketball or hockey, that the garden was truly built for. And in 1955, a favorite son from the North End made the walls of the garden shake more than any trains ever could. 
Tony DeMarco, what it was like. Uh, well, there's no way explaining that. When he won, there was cars going on out, them people cheering, and a banner put across the street where he lived. Everybody, the highest to the lowest, they all adored him. He won the world championship. Every round was exciting because he won right after the champ, and he he pounded him for 13 rounds till he knocked him out in the 14th round. He just kept after him, and he took the heart out of the guy, and he knocked him out. He fought, he fought like a lion that night. DeMarco's career began on Fleet Street back in 1947. Because he was only 15, he had to find a way to get a boxing license. So, like a good Italian young man, he turned to his friends and the church. I was three years too young to fight. So therefore, I went to the corner, north end of Boston, Fleet Street, and a few of the guys were there, and I'm looking for someone that was 18 years old. And, and, and sure enough, Tony DeMarco, his name was Lobo, we call him Lobo, came over and I borrowed his birth. I, I told him how old he was. He, was. he said he was 18 years old. So then I said, here's what I want you to do. Go to Sacred Heart's church. Father Mario is there. Ask him that you want a birth, uh, a birth record so you can prove that you're 18 years old for, for working purposes. He says, good idea. I said, then give it to me. Father Mario was excited himself. I mean, to think Tony DeMarco was going, going to work and helping his mother and father. And he said, oh, and he spoke broken English. He said, nice, a nice a boy. He says, I, I'm a glad, I'm a happy for you. You know, I'm happy for you. And sure enough, he gave him uh, Tony DeMarco's birth certificate. Also, he gave me the birth certificate. Here. So I began to fight under Tony DeMarco. His name was Antonio DeMarco. <clears throat> and a few fights later, he decided, Tony decided he wanted to fight. So I said, well, fine, but whose, whose name are you going to uh, use? He said, I'm going to use my own. I said, you can't use your name, your own name. I said, because I have it. Go to the corner and borrow someone else's name. To many, the garden has been like an old friend. Despite the blackouts, obstructed views, hydroplaning basketball players, soaring temperatures, and even rats the size of shoeboxes, the place the Tech's built will be missed. We walk in there, it was like home, right, Roger? Uh, it was yeah. like being home. It was like being home, you know? And we had a great time. <laughs>